every quarter has been some trouble or the other, some India-Pakistan, some political uncertainty, some Harshad Mehta, Ketan Parekh, some change is always happening in the last 25 years, every quarter. So you you n- n- never feel any time that everything is sub acha hai, sub stable hai. Yeah. But in spite of that, India has grown. So I think having that bifocal and this paradoxical approach to India, that great story in the long term, but always uncertain, volatile, ambiguous in the short term. Thank you so much, Jashesh, for joining today. And for everyone watching in this country, we all uh, have followed your journey and, and we all look up to uh, the, you know, the way you have built uh, Edelweiss, your business, and, and, and why it is extremely important today that we are talking is, you know, you started very, very early. And, and, and to me, your journey is also very uh, reflective of India's growth, the way uh, you grew. And today we are talking about Atmanirbhar Bharat. But I think in middle 1990s, uh, there was this Atmanirbharta because there were so many players and you were the local disruptor who built, who started small and, and, and today has built uh, such a large entity. And I, I would really request if you could, you know, take us through the journey and more important for entrepreneurs today, for startups today, if you could tell us, you know, two, three key things that if you look back today and say, okay, I, these were some of the things I did right. And that's why I am where I am. Yeah, I think it's, uh, it's actually very interesting that you say that, uh, you know, Edelweiss is now 25 years old and India is this part of economic journey, as we call India opening up and all is also now almost 25 years old because it was after the 91 balance of payment crisis that Indian economy actually took almost like a pivotal turn and started uh, on a new kind of a framework. So it's interesting, I think, and it's always a good time to sit back and look back. And ironically, I actually went to do an MBA in order not to be an entrepreneur. So my, <laughs> my, my whole ambition, because I come from a business family, uh, my, my father, my uncles, everybody was always in business. So I always had this desire not to be in business. I wanted mm. to be, uh, you know, an officer in a company, working an executive. So that's why I went and did my MBA and then joined ICICI. And my idea was to stay put uh, there for as long as I can and continue to grow. But I think after the 91, 92, uh, you know, as India's economic liberation started happening, and also, I was very fortunate that in ICICI, I, I met with a lot of entrepreneurs because mm. I think part of the part of the job was to work with companies. And I was in the export group where I dealt with a lot of new age companies who were competing in global markets. So companies like Infosys and all were my clients. And this was mm. you know, almost 28, 29 years ago. And it was at that point that you saw that there were entrepreneurs of a different class and who were really competing in global markets and India was opening up and government was encouraging new entrepreneurs and you know there were foreign investors coming in. So I would say the 91 to 96 period was a very fertile period for entrepreneurship and India's economy opening up and we all got caught into that. We were young, partly naive, partly the enthusiasm of you know all this new stuff is happening. Capital markets are going to open up. Insurance banking is going to open up. India's financial services. And, you know, as uh, when we were growing up, you read all this, you know, things about Wall Street and U.S. capital markets and all. So there was always a feeling that all this will happen in India. I must say that a lot of my hypothesis at that time, the reality has exceeded those. But a lot of other hypotheses have not come true also. So it just shows that... <laughs> The, the hypothesis you formulate are also ultimately hypothesis only. The reality will take its own, uh, you know, its own path. But what happens in a lot of this is there is an asymmetric payoff. And I think that that is what actually at that time, including Vidya, my wife, who was also my batchmate in IIM Ahmedabad, she, uh, she used to work in an investment bank and uh, she encouraged me and said, if you want to be an entrepreneur, try it out because ultimately being an MBA, you can always get a job again. Yeah. But there is no harm. And I think, uh, you know, we said, okay, I think it looks exciting. All our dreams are there. And we started off in a very small way with just about a crore of rupees of capital. We put together 
Our equity capital now is more than 8,000 crore, but at that time, even one crore looked like a big amount. And uh, as I said, I think uh, there is usually, we always underestimate the upside that will happen over a longer period of time. And in my wildest imagination, I would not have, uh, you know, have even formed a hypothesis or assumed the kind of growth that we have seen, but also India has seen. You know, a lot of people uh, uh, started, and, and, and you rightly said 91 to 96 was a very interesting phase uh, uh, in our country, uh, in our country's journey. Uh, but you know, so many would have started with you and so many people, you know, we see uh, uh, getting into the domain that you are in, but what you have built with Edelweiss, if I may say so, is a very iconic brand. And then we have to recognize uh, the journey. If I have to ask you that, you know, as an entrepreneur, if you have to say, you know, in hindsight, these were two, three things that we did right, or we learned along the way, which turned out to be right, what would those things be? So I think from very early on, uh, um, you know, one of the guiding principles we had was get good people in the company and get them as yeah. partners. And one of the things we have done is we have actually one of the widest employee stock option program. And employee stock option is not to give economic benefit only, but to really give that emotional feeling of ownership that we are all you know equal and we count so like in our company we don't use the word founders and co-founders and all because i feel every year whoever is adding value is a founder there can't be any grandfather rights so we started off as a new age company because fortunately we are not a old business family which had anything to protect or any any you know the legacy uh, systems and all that so we started off with that. So I think starting off as partnership, getting some great people. And I think the best part of Alewai journey has been, uh, you know, getting really a lot mm. of great who have stayed on, grown with the company and, uh, you know, and, and people. So idea was to create a company where you can attract the best. You are actually blind to, you know, either gender or caste or anything. You just look at the, you know, very meritocratic uh, approach and we are very harsh as a company. We evaluate ourselves a lot, both internally and externally. But it's a very fair kind of an organization. So I think some of the... So when we started, we put down the guiding principles of the company. And even now, we, when you open our annual report or you go to our site, you will see the guiding principles. And we have added a couple of them more over the years. But when we started, we started with some of the guiding principles. There will be a fair organization will be a partnership, we'll protect our capital. So the other thing we've been very careful is to make sure that our capital is a very precious commodity because you can't take that for granted. And we, and we don't come from a large business house where there was you know, a lot of capital available. So we always been very careful. We always made sure that we reinvested back the capital in a very thoughtful way. We raised capital, we always very well capitalized and we protected our capital and we grew the capital and we made sure that we took risk. Obviously, there is risk. Even if you think you are not taking risk, there is some risk <laughs> that is always going to be there. But you have the meaty guns in place. You have the fallbacks, the plan B, plan C. So I think risk management and ensuring that we were very, very careful about it. And the other was, you know, people. And, and, and then the third thing that we have always insisted and the guiding principles helped us a lot in that is building a culture. So even today, if you ask me the three assets we would have, in, in order of importance would be people, culture, and capital. And I and I used to think that people and culture are interchangeable, but I learned one thing in the last 25 years that culture affects people and people affect culture. Like you and I are the same people, but when we go to maybe another country, we behave differently because the culture there is different versus the culture, the way we drive on the road in India will be different from how we'll drive outside. So culture also affects individual behavior. So I think people and culture, you have the right mix of that. And then you have, you know, because we are in financial services, capital and risk management is very important. And you have the right guiding principles around that. A lot of other things fall in place. Then, you know, your business evolves, your yeah. uh, strategies change. You make mistakes along the way. And we made a lot of mistakes along the way. Uh, that, you know, if we talk about our mistakes, we can talk for hours and hours. But uh, you you evolve, and I think uh, unfortunately you always uh, always always learn by experience. So I think in that sense it's been a great journey. But uh, the mistakes that have been uh, 
uh, I think really, uh, you know, harmful ones are the ones if you make the people mistake. So we've been very, very careful of that. And uh, have we hired wrong people in the past years? But we have been very careful to make sure that we acknowledge that and get that out. And when we hire the right people, we actually grow them a lot. And I always say that even hiring people is a risk because if you hire a wrong person, uh, they might take value away for a year or two. But if you hire the right person, they add value for 20 years. So there is a yeah. good day to pay off. So you be careful about hiring. Also acknowledge, evaluate people and see whether they are the right people from an integrity and capability and all that point of view. So I would say, I think, I think getting the people equation right has been one of the most fortunate things. And again, I say there is also, you know, fortune and luck in all this because a lot of people who, who ended up coming to Edelweiss were, you know, I met somebody somewhere and we started talking. They came and interviewed and they ended up becoming or somebody was working in one part of the company, uh, you know, wanted to leave. And I convinced that individual that maybe uh, they should look at something else. And then they just prospered and, and became a senior leader in the company. So there is an element of, you know, serendipity. All of that is also there. But we all have had the biggest tailwind that India has had, which is, you know, the last 25 years of growth. And that tailwind, then over, 20, over 25 years, the compounding really happens. It's very hard to imagine. So when we started 25 years ago, I could not have imagined. But if you just do the math, this was almost an inevitable kind of stage because India growing at that, at, at that you know, at that pace, you know, would have got us here in some form or the other. It is a case study of sorts because when we say we and we talk about Indian entrepreneurship, we say that, you know, Indian entrepreneurs are not like maybe entrepreneurs outside because, uh, who build a very egalitarian, very democratic setup. But I think you have and not think you have because I have also had the opportunity to talk to many of the leaders in your company and, and, and you rightly said they behave, talk and conduct themselves as owners, as founders. And I think you did that very early on is also a very strong part of the conversation that we should have because still if you look at the world and the way we build businesses in our country it's very hierarchical it's very old-fashioned and and when we talk of the you know the iconic brands outside uh, the country then we should look at Edelweiss also because you built that and now what you're saying is that you had that uh, very very early on when you started this mind frame I think, I think this egalitarian or a fair culture and no grandfather rights and all because it's an advantage of you know being a professional because I started my career in ICSA earning 2,800 rupees. So I also got my <laughs> appointment letter and salary slip. So you can empathize with that. I mean, uh, if you had inherited a business, you may not have gone through all of that. And you know, what is my take home and uh, how much leave I have every year. So you do empathize that, you know, people, uh, you know, want a few simple things from an organization and the organization should strive hard to, to give that. So I think that way being a professional company, being, uh, because being, you know, first generation entrepreneurs, a lot of this came automatically. You didn't have to, but idea was also that I think we are in the knowledge business and where people are very important because yeah. it's not that you put up a steel plant or a cement plant. It's not an asset-based business. It's a very people-based, very knowledge-based business. And when we started off, we hardly had any capital. So the only real asset we had was the people. And we were doing advisory services and investment banking and research. And so you did really had to invest in your people all the time. And we invest a lot. Even now, I think uh, one of our biggest, all of us, including me, like, for example, every few years we get coach and all that. So we all have executive coaches and we make sure that leaders, because in a lot of companies, you know, people just approach saying well, leadership happens on its own. You, you <laughs> give them the opportunity, some people will grow, some will not grow. But we do believe that helping, hand-holding, mentoring, coaching, all that also expertise. Because if a, a Sachin Tendulkar can use the help yeah. of a coach, why can't a good executive who has a lot of potential to grow so we believe in all this a lot. So we invest a lot in, in people and we make sure that people get the best possible growth opportunity at a personal level also because if the people will grow, the organization will grow. And our idea has been, I think one of the things I've seen and I've worked with a lot of companies in India as um, you know, they've been clients and they've been friends and all that. I think one of the things that really kills 
culture in a company is this need for control and mm. authority and i think i have seen uh, and whether it's a family business or a professional business wherever the boss comes from control uh, and that partly comes out of insecurities and partly just the desire to micromanage and all so we so we have created a culture where control is only if it is required otherwise the idea is to give more control to other people who can make the best possible decision so like in edelweiss we say that we have a functional hierarchy because we can't have anarchy you can't have chaos we yes. need to report to somebody somebody needs to finalize as somebody kras and all that so we have a functional hierarchy but we have no intellectual hierarchy so even a first year associate can argue with me so when i when i when we are evaluating a case or an investment proposal uh even a first year analyst can argue with me saying no this hypothesis and usually they are right because they know <laughs> more hours on that than i have spent because a lot of my knowledge ends up being very superficial so yeah i have a lot of experience but then you know you know what the current market situation is a lot of them know that and i think having that culture is also very important so no intellectual hierarchy and that partly comes out of you know insecurity partly the desire to control the desire to you know to micromanage all of that so we have tried to try try to work out so that that is low because that really allows people to to grow and prosper you know you've been a part of the journey of the incredible journey or the as we have made as a country and 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 then today we are unapologetically indians uh, and 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 i am in the world of entrepreneurship and startups where today i'm seeing young indians go across the world with big build uh, great businesses but you know somewhere there are two narratives in the country right now and 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 i'm sure you would have followed some of the i, I don't want to mention but some of the articles which have recently been doing rounds that india lost on the opportunity that it had somewhere we messed up the opportunity we had and and then there is this other uh, view that you know our time has just begun over the years one of the things i've learned and i i say this very often that india is a complete paradox and uh, it uh, the, you know there is a quote which says india works hard to keep the optimist and the pessimist both happy so <laughs> yeah. there is a kind of story where where you choose and which the same old cliche about glass half full half empty but it's really true about india i think whatever we say about india is never as good as it is made out to be never is it as bad as it made out to be and uh, i think uh, one of the part in india and part of that is media part of that is the way we are indians we have a lot of drama in our lives so we swing <laughs> a lot from euphoria to complete fear to you know this extreme that india is either the, the the greatest opportunity in the world or it is completely you know missed the opportunity and is not going to go anywhere and i have learned over the last 30 years of my career that actually the extremes are never true they are not a true reflection india is always in the middle yes are we underperforming to our potential india yes i think india's potential is a lot higher but that that is true with lopit you know a lot of us as individuals also i mean yeah. sure we are all, all actually capable of doing a lot more like a few years ago i could not even run 3 4 kilometers and i decided to um, uh, you know uh, uh, first i did half marathon then a full marathon so i didn't know how much i can do so we all we all don't know what our real potential is but i think india can grow at 8 to 10% a year consistently but because of a lot of legacy issues and all that we are stuck in between maybe 5 to 6 to 7% growth but it's hard to imagine india growing below 5 and it's hard to imagine india growing above 8 on a long term consistent basis and if you look at between uh 95 to now or any period if you look at post 80s after we change our economic uh, policies and structure india has grown grown at between 4 to 8% a year on a consistent there have been few years which have been above 8 and a couple of years which have been below 4 but if you look at even the quarterly rate of this yeah. you know uh you know if you take 30 years which will be 120 quarters large part of them will be between 4 to 8 so i think we should assume that india will grow at 5 to 6% based on hypothesis on that because one of the other things you learn as you get older is happiness is also a function of expectations versus and reality so <laughs> so idea is in india not to keep your expectations too high but i think uh, it is it is 
okay to assume a, f- a five six percent growth in India, which will be an underperformance. I'm not saying no because I think India can grow at eight ten percent a year, and if we can grow that, it will be great because there'll be so much wealth creation and people getting jobs and poverty coming down, and all of that. But if not, we will still grow at about five six, and that is good enough. And if you look at like the example I gave, I I graduated in nineteen eighty nine. Where India's economy was a two hundred billion dollar economy, two hundred yeah. billion, and this is in US dollar, and the, the rupee is also at that time the rupee was eighteen rupees to a dollar, so we were a two hundred billion dollar country. When we started Edelweiss, India had become a three hundred billion dollar country. But in two thousand and seven, we became one trillion dollars. So in two thousand seven, Shraddha, after Almost, uh, you know, sixty years of independence, we became one trillion dollars. We added another one trillion dollars between two thousand seven to two thousand fifteen. We became two trillion dollar in two thousand fifteen, and or uh, as you remember, between seven to fifteen, we had the global financial crisis, the mm. policy paralysis, the high inflation. Ru- rupee fell in two thousand thirteen fourteen because of taper tantrum and all that. In spite of that, in U.S. dollar terms. India added one trillion. We in in eight years we added to our economy what we added in the first sixty years. Yeah. Whatever we say between two thousand fifty to two thousand twenty, we have added another one trillion. So we added one trillion in sixty years, then we added one trillion in eight years, then we added one trillion in five years. So we are now at an at a stage where we are adding the size of India of two thousand seven every three four years now. Yeah. And that's the kind of compounding of growth that is happening. It's hard to imagine, but it's happening in front of our. It's happened in front of our eyes. I mean, when we started, the total bank deposits was only five lakh crore. Today, bank deposits are almost one lakh thirty thousand crore. They have grown yeah. by twenty five, twenty six times. So I think India, this kind of growth is there because we have savings, we have investment rate. We will go down to if we ever go under six, it will be a disappointment. We go above six, it will be a lot of happiness. We will end up being between five and seven, and as long as we align ourselves to those expectations, India will do well. I think India will do well, but India will also be highly volatile. There is a lot of uncertainty and ambiguity and policy changes and all that. Partly our own doing, partly the drama that we like because we like to tinker a lot. All of that. I do. I do feel that Indians we have a lot of drama in our lives, and I think the Indian media and all also they feast on that. <laughs> Part of this, if we bring it down, we take a long-term calm view. I think India will do well, but India will always be volatile. So the other thing I always say that India needs what I call a bifocal approach. You need to keep an eye on the long term where India can be in 25 years, but also the next two quarters will always be trouble. And it's my own experience in the last 25 years. Every quarter has been some trouble or the other, some India-Pakistan, some political uncertainty, some Harshad Mehta, Ketan Parekh, some change is always happening in the last 25 years. Every quarter, so you you n- n- never feel any time that everything is sab acha hai, sab stable hai. Yeah. But in spite of that, India has grown. So I think having that bifocal and this paradoxical approach to India, that great story in the long term. But always uncertain, volatile, ambiguous in the short term. If that is, if you had to say one or two things that we need to do as a country, uh, uh, because you know, and again, I'm talking more in terms of employment, which is today a huge challenge, and especially in the pandemic, it, you know, so many people have lost their jobs. There is a, at the ground level, there is a little bit of a, not a little, a lot of uncertainty. If you have to say that as a country, one or two things that we should focus on and do it well. what are those things so i think you hit upon uh, upon the right word that is uncertainty i think see there is any way uncertain in the world there will be a covid and there will be maybe you know uh, you know us interest rates going up and those uncertainties are a given but i think our approach should be can we reduce the uncertainty can we have more policy stability more long term planning because by doing all that you reduce uncertainty for entrepreneurs which then reflects in their ability to make long term investment because if you want to change the gst rate every year it's very hard mm-hmm. for for somebody to make a long term investment so i think all these are small examples i think a reducing uncertainty and hence reducing risk there will always be risk but if you can reduce it uh by yeah. you know processes and through certainty 
and I, I sometimes give the example of the airline industry. I mean, 30, 40 years ago, airlines were risky and there were accidents and all. But if you look at most of the airlines all over the world have a standardization, there'll be a checklist, there'll be a protocol, the announcements that happen, the, there is a huge amount of standardization and they've reduced uncertainty as much as they can. And I think that is what we need to do as a country. Then we can, you know, uh, continue to grow as close to our potential as possible. The other thing we need to do is India's financial system is very inefficient. And we see this, you know, periodic, uh, you know, issues that happen. The cost of capital is very high. It's a very strange, uh, you know, situation we have that people who save money feel they are not earning enough return on that money. <laughs> to borrow money, feel that they are paying a huge price. And they both can't be true, right? Because ultimately, the job of the financial system is to take money from people who save money to people who want to borrow money. That is largely whether you are a mutual fund or a, uh, or a bank or an NBFC, that is what you are doing. You are channelizing money from the providers of capital to the users of capital. But that intermediation is very expensive because the, the you know, there is a lot of inefficiency, rules and regulations, industry structure. If you can bring down cost of capital, uh, one by reducing uncertainty and, and and the other by making our financial system more efficient, this can be a big catalyst because we have entrepreneurs. I mean, we have yeah. more entrepreneurs, yes. But I think there are a lot of entrepreneurs. I'm sure you deal with a lot of them. There are a lot of entrepreneurs. There's a lot of opportunity they need capital, they, they need access to capital, equity capital, debt capital, all of that. And they need an environment that is as stable as it can be. We've been talking about this segment, MSMEs and SMEs. In ka actual terms, may growth or scale kar me ke liye as a country, what are one or two things that we need to do for this segment, which is contributing significantly to our GDP? I think, A, obviously, access to capital. You ask almost every MSME, access to capital at the right price, at the right time uh, is, is very hard. I think MSMEs are the one sector that I think individual home buyers, you want to buy, <clears throat> you want to buy a car or a TV or a home, it's, I think, now got easier to get a loan. I think corporations, large companies can borrow in India outside. I think the MSMEs are the ones whose availability of capital, both equity and credit, has, has been coming down over the years. So we have to do a lot of things and it needs government, RBI. We also need to develop the financial, uh, financial system, the economy, all of that. You know, information is a very important part. Now with GST and all more information will be available. But all this is required. So I think providing capital to MSMEs is one very important part. The other one is MSMEs have undergone a big change. So... Um, if you see India is constantly changing and there are three parts of the economy. There is a formal economy, there is an informal economy, and there is something in between which is called the semi-formal economy. Okay. A lot of MSMEs are in the semi-formal economy. Uh, to handhold them when they are semi-formal, is uh, the, 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 there is a, lo a lot of intervention required. And I think by making it easy, creating associations which help them to move from the informal to the formal. Because with you know GST, demonetization, all these things we have done, we are trying to formalize the economy. But but it but it doesn't happen overnight. Uh, mm. Informal companies become formal overnight. They go through this semi-formal status. In fact, our NBFC focuses a lot on companies which are in the semi-formal one because they have the track record, they have information, but they are not as uh, you know as formalized as they will be maybe in five ten years. Yeah. So I think that whole hand-holding, because we see our economy in two, when we talk to government also, they see formal and informal. I think the larger part of the MSME world is in the semi-formal and, and creating clear policies, hand-holding, the credit to semi-formal. If you look at a lot of the MFIs and all that have come about to provide money, you know, credit for the informal sector. Mm, mm. Because that is informal. Yeah. The rural sector. There are banks and NBFCs for the formal sector. There is very little kind of focus on the semi-formal. So that is another another passion of mine. And we talk about it a lot. We need to help the semi-formal sector grow. What do you have to say about the tech lending platforms? Because in the startup world, we saw so much of investment happen in the last couple of years. Uh, what's your 
and then with the nbfcs the lending and, and now with government coming up with this new thing that uh, we you know large corporates can all be banks uh, what do you have to say about the tech lending platforms that have come up in the country i think it's been it's been a fabulous innovation and in all parts of all parts of the financial services industry we need innovation and disruption and all that and uh, Uh, we have seen some of it in the payment space yeah uh, we need that what you are talking about in the credit space there is asset management insurance it's happening in insurance like in the general insurance space so if you look at financial services there is you know general insurance life insurance asset management broking uh, you know the, then wealth management credit uh, payments all these are parts of the financial services system and all of them are not the same they appear all as one so i think the payment part has got disrupted the most and that has been a great thing because really the payment system is you all we seen the india stack and upi and all that i think credit could get disrupted also and it should get disrupted because that is where the intermediation cost will come down so a lot of this platform which are there they are able to uh, you know i think reduce the intermediation cost improve the customer experience also because uh, one of the other problem in financial services we have it's a very product driven industry it's not a customer driven industry we don't <laughs> talk about customer experience and all as much but i think with technology a lot of that will be possible with technology the other big advantage we will have is the the you know the the unit cost can come down because i mm. think cost economics in in financial system has been a problem if somebody applies for a 5 lakh rupee loan it's easy to process it because the processing cost is worth from the loan amount but if somebody wants a 5000 rupee loan mm. the processing cost pay can be high and technology can bring that also down because the other paradox of india is that india is a large economy at 3 trillion dollars we are among the top 6 economies in the world uh, there is only you know uk germany usa japan and and china ahead of us as economy size so we are large economy but our per capita is only about Two thousand odd dollars. Yeah. So we are a very small because all these countries are at thirty, forty, fifty thousand dollars per capita. Even China is at you know fourteen, fifteen thousand. We are only at two thousand. Yeah. So if you look at on a per capita basis, India is a very small country. If you look at the three trillion GDP, we are a large company. And the problem that happens is, in order to make the business work, you have to worry about unit economics. You can't work. Mm-hmm. Away, you can't say it's a, it's a three trillion economy because your buyer. an average buyer is only only at $2000 per capita buyer so like in insurance or in mutual fund your your average ticket size is about 1/10th of the average ticket size in the world so like in in mutual yeah. fund it is about 1000 rupees is what they invest in a sip or something now how do you have an agent and an advisor <laughs> who can make that unit economics work and in that i think technology will play a big a big role in bringing unit economics down very quickly and that will really expand the the services including credit to a lot of people india has only about 40 50 million people who have access to credit we need 300 million people who can have access to credit but for that we should be able to do a 5000 10000 allow people to build their credit histories and all that so i think technology in credit and all parts of financial services is going to be the biggest game changer and all the new fintechs and all are adding to the you know uh, yeah. to the, uh, you know swirling that is going around so it's great and it's fascinating to watch are you going to rachesh are you going to be investing in startups do you invest in startups we invest in startups all the time because in edelweiss we have a lot of startups i mean <laughs> to, uh, uh, to to uh, to honestly give you an idea i mean that is actually what we do if you look at edelweiss we mm. are not a financial services company we are a company with a lot of a lot of financial services businesses underneath so like you must have recently seen we have got pag as a large private equity fund as a partner in a wealth management business they valued that business at 4000 crore and they are putting 2000 crore to buy 51% stake in that business but this is the business that we started it was like 25 years ago with 1 mm. crore capital and over the years we have raised some money and we have totally invested about 100 crores in this business and we st- started with investment banking added broking and wealth management and all of that but today this business is worth 4000 crore so we invested about 100 crores over say 20 years and it's now worth 4000 crore 
same thing we have a general insurance business we invested 300 crores in that in the last 3 years but it's a large business hugely scalable and each one independently if you were to go out and value them they've given us a great return on capital same thing on the life insurance business in the asset management in our arc you must have known that we are one of the largest we are the largest arc in india we started our arc business with a 30 crore investment in 2008 and over the last uh 10 12 years we have invested about another 150 crores in that business so total investment of 170 crores but today the capital in that business is worth 2000 crores mm. so we invest in businesses but of course we don't just we are not a passive investor we also get the management team and we put the system and we handhold and we help grow the companies but today edelweiss has got 10 businesses uh, we have an insurance broking business which was a small business where we got Arthur Gallagher which is the fourth largest insurance broker in the world they've come and bought a 30% stake and valued the company at 250 crore this is the business that we started 10 12 years ago from scratch we have not invested a single rupee it's been profitable from day one so we have 10 businesses in advice insurance broking life insurance general insurance each of them has been a startup because we have started all these business and over the years we acquired and grown so we do that all the time we also invest in but we are not a fund we are, we don't uh, we are not passive investors but we constantly invest in businesses and grow and we look at asymmetric payoff as i said you can invest 100 crores the terrain businesses we have gone wrong we have closed down those businesses also mm. and we invested mm. 30 40 crores and we said you know the hypothesis doesn't work we close it down but you invest 30 40 crores hypothesis doesn't work you close it down you invest 30 40 crores hypothesis works it can become a 1000 2000 3000 yeah yeah and that you is know what but no but with you know with your track record if i may say so and then the way you've scaled uh, businesses you know it would be so valuable if you have a fund which invests in startup businesses also no because you can bring so much of value to businesses yes but you know there are already a lot of funds out there <laughs> and uh, i think I, i think providing fund capital and passive capital is is got there are a lot of people there and, and there are very smart people out there i think growing businesses incubating businesses growing them creating great leaders out there empowering mm. them even giving them skin in the game uh that so we are so we actually are builder of of businesses we are not just investors you have mm. to invest to build the business that is but only investing there are a lot of other people can do but investing and building businesses including you know changing management team if required because there was a good management team at the startup stage now the business is scaling you need to you know get some people who can put you know systems and processes and technology so we do all of that so but we build businesses that is what we do i mean there are 10 businesses in edelweiss and we see each one of them as a stand alone business we have an asset management business amc business mutual fund uh you know which has been growing very well we were in in that business we were about 1000 crore aum about about 6 years ago we are almost 45000 crores now wow wow so we mm. we grow businesses so we we incubate invest uh you know build businesses grow businesses then we bring partners in that so five of our businesses have got outside partners tokyo marine arthur gallagher cdpq we bring all these investors now we brought pag so our idea is we think like how do we create value but by doing all of this identifying opportunity bringing management team giving the capital putting it together and we understand financial services so i think uh, this is a fairly uh, you know the unique mix and we have a track record of having shown that we can build this again and again and we constantly yeah. what's keeping you going every day is there a big dream which is still left to do or achieve I think the idea is to build, and actually, though Edelweiss has grown a lot, we are still a very small player. Mm-hmm. So there is a lot of growth ahead of us. But I think what our aspiration is, it's not only growth. I think growth is India. Anyway, growth will happen, but it's quality and excellence, and really, uh, and and part of quality is also having people who are empowered and great institutions you can build, great organizations you can build. which are in you know, a long term sustainable that is the fun in that that is a joy it's not making returns and i always say that you know market cap and profits and all are all output variables but the input variables has to be energy and passion and uh, you know all the qualitative yeah. factors 
that we talk about and that is where you enjoy no nobody enjoys i mean and that is the problem if you say india is a 3 trillion dollar country it's not fun but you say how india has built businesses and entrepreneurs and yeah. all of that is where i think the pride comes in so i think the idea is to continue build an organization build businesses have people grow and have something that is of real value uh to the to all the stakeholders over the years that you built and it, and it's been fun journey so it's not that you are hating yourself and killing yourself and doing <laughs> you enjoy it because ultimately that is what we all convert towards i mean when i look at even people like you and all uh i think i know you started in times of india or something huh? yeah yeah and then you you have converged and then you know forged your own path because we all we all start at any place but we all eventually find if you are fortunate enough to find you know things we enjoy and we can grow and it's not that you enjoy every day we all have our down days and we all have our days saying you know what is this for and 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 why do this but overall at the end of the day you sit back and you enjoy and i call this like running a running a marathon when you run a marathon you don't always enjoy why you are running because sometimes you are huffing and puffing and your knees are hurting and um, all of that is there but at the end of the marathon you feel satisfaction you feel yeah. accomplishment and that is why why you do all this uh, ultimately there is no real end goal as such uh, that you are trying to because i think edelweiss has become uh, you know fairly large but the for us the size is not important if you can build a quality organization then quality not only in our eyes but other people's eyes i think that will be a good thing to have and it's a constant investment and improvement that you need what's that one thing in your life which gives you anchoring as a human being as a professional as a person and and if you could talk about do you have any spiritual uh, leanings or you know i just love to know what's that one thing that gives you uh the tank so uh i think it, it's a cliche uh, it's a cliche but uh, the family is the anchor i think you know vidya and my kids uh we we just enjoy being with each other and you know i think the good thing about the covid pandemic has been my daughter was studying in the us she came back my <laughs> son is at home is you know working in mumbai so having all of us together after a long time all four of us have been together for such a long time and that itself is a great so i think family is obviously anchor uh, are, you know lots of friends they also very big anchors and things like obviously like you know running and swimming i love that so those are anchors i read a lot i see all the books behind you also uh, so <laughs> i enjoy reading i end up reading about between 50 60 to 80 books a year wow. and, and i just enjoy reading a lot so i think all these are the anchors which are there but i think uh, at the end of the day uh, we have all evolved and i think uh, i i am a very different person now than what i was a few years ago so i was very analytical very atheist very uh, so i'm not very religious even now but you are spiritual i have become spiritual over the years i meditate i uh, also pray but it's more spiritual because i think we have all grown up as being very analytical very iq oriented and you you realize that there is a much larger world the eq world and the spiritual world are the different world than the iq world so i have also become a lot more calmer a lot more uh, i think easy going <laughs> i i used to be a kind of guy who is to i used to get out of the plane and i used to time myself how much time it takes to get out of the plane to be in the car and i <laughs> that time as short as possible i have to travel a lot so i wanted to be but i think that hurry has gone away that um, i think as we evolve but it's partly age partly the family and all and then you realize that you know uh, the fun in in the journey is is a lot more fun so all this other one so not not very spiritual or religious but i also uh, I, love, i follow buddhism a lot and mm. I, i i like to learn so i think one of the things that in my life that i have learned uh, that i have enjoyed and i hope i continue to do is constantly ability to learn and i just love to learn so i i read books to learn i discover new things and it's amazing that every time i, re- I realize so much more i don't know <laughs> so much to learn so to give you an idea about a few years ago i didn't know how to swim so i was uh, 50 years old when i said i want to learn swimming 
Wow. I, coach and I started learning swimming and now I, I can swim for an hour, two hours in the sea also. So I think that what if you constantly learn and having that curiosity about learning is I find a very energizing force. But that works for me. I think the different thing works for different people. But that I find as, uh, as one of the constants in my life. 